Welcome back, CIT 15, week 12, I'm talking like, I don't know who, Yogi the Bear. Uh, week 12, you've got, uh, if you're in the online class, you got to do the discussion for week 12. You have to do your assignments all the way through week 12, this is old hat, but it's always kind of fun to see what's on the docket. It's my new word, it's been my word of the week, docket. You guys know it? Docket, what's on the docket? I don't even know what it means, but I've been using it like hell's freezing over. Docket, calendar or list of cases for trial or people having cases pending. Document or label listing the contents package. Yeah, with a document label listing the contents. So <coughs> contents, what's on the docket? That's what's on the docket. Uh, you got search history. This is cool. See what you've been looking at. If you didn't know that, see what other people have been looking at if you have access to their account. Programming week 12, make sure you watch that video, it says important. And then a paper, just like, tell me what you're learning in this class, the reflection deal. And then, uh, in here, this is week one, this is week <coughs> two, three, four, five, this is week through nine, 10, uh, 11, and 12, so you should need to be in the third one in access. Access a little bit tougher. And then down in here, you need to do through exam, the quiz 12, and make sure you're done with the Word and Excel project, right? There's a little project in there. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that, how, that's what you need to be doing. How's that going for you? How's that going for you? Is it going good? If this course is more work than other classes, raise your hand. If this course is less work than other courses, raise your hand. Like, how much more work is it? Because, like, I, I lose touch of that stuff, right? Like, I'm not in school anymore. My I'm not doing it. My courses are really easy, and my biology class, I dropped, so that one doesn't count anymore. That one was the hard one. Yeah. And this one, it's not like, it's just a lot of time. A lot of time. time. It's a lot of time. A lot of time. There's no shortcuts. No shortcuts. Just got to sit down and look at it. Yeah. And especially with my slow computer, I know it's no yeah. shortcuts. Well, it's good stuff. You learn it, it'll serve you well. Right? Like, you want to know about this stuff in this world. I mean, you guys know so much more already than most people about computers. Like, most people, go ask 100 people, hey, man, what does zeros and ones have to do with computers? And why? Why? Well, I don't know. Most people want to know. You know. Because it's on and off, baby. It's transistors. It's coding schemes. Right? So, good stuff. All right, so... uh this week we're looking at systems development, but there's a little cleaning up to do, and uh, and this has also just kind of been jammed into the systems development uh, presentation. So I got a little presentation here, systems development and programming, and I figure we'll bang through this, and then you know we'll uh, uh, jump and look at a few other things, and um, and then one thing I just want to say because databases was kind of like. One of the things that I wanted to make sure that we covered, since you guys, whoa, that doesn't look good. That's all messed up. Download that, see if it looks better. Download. Scanning for viruses, open. Dun, 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 dun. Aha, looks much better. So we already looked at this. This is basically how a relational <coughs> database works. And uh, we've got the customers table over here on the left, which would be these fields, right? And then we have the movies table over here on the left or on the right, which would be those. And then we have the rentals table in the middle. Tried to distinguish them a little bit, different colors. But those are tables. So when we talk about databases, a lot of times people are referring to relational databases. They could be RDBMS, Relational Database Management Software or System, right? Microsoft SQL. So Microsoft SQL. Uh, Microsoft SQL, right? Uh, there's MySQL, which is not Microsoft SQL, so that's MySQL. That's an open source relational database. And then we have Microsoft SQL Server, and that's Microsoft SQL. <laughs> that's Microsoft SQL Server, right? And then we have Oracle, Oracle, uh, and uh, so all three of those are like the big databases: MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server. And Oracle, and they use a language called SQL, or people will say pronounce that SQL, 
And SQL stands for Structured Query Language. And so SQL is just a language for asking queries of the database. And so, I don't know, I'm just looking for some SQL to look at. Focus. And create table if not exists, right? That, that's some X SQL right there. Or focus. You know, select, count, from, join, where, group by, order by, right? And so there's some more structured query language. And so it's a language just for asking queries of the database. <laughs> if you're not familiar with that word query in England, that means to have a question. They have different words for things in England, but query is a question. And if you get in a line, it's a queue. And if you need to go to the John, it's the Lou, <laughs> right? They just have a bunch of different words for things in England. So query is a question in England, though they definitely understand question too. I don't know why we call it a query in a database. But when you want to ask a question of a database, you query it. You ask a query of it. And you structured query language, SQL. And now you know like the three big databases. And those are SQL databases. And they have schema defined. And so some of the schema, and the schema being like, you know, how does this thing work? A schema is like, you know, I don't know, what the hell does a schema mean? A representation of a plan or theory in the form of an outline or model, a syllogistic figure, so logic, uh, con conception of what is common to all members of a class, a general or essential type or form. So basically it's a plan or an outline or it's a model. It's a way you got to use it. And so this is called a schema, right? The database, da relational databases have a schema, which are basically the people who make databases, relational databases, say you got to use it in this way, okay? There's also a whole other class of databases called schema lists, which basically just give you the tools to store stuff, and if you jack it up, that's your own fault, right? So instead of relying on a company, Microsoft or Oracle or the open source MySQL one, to say this is how you need to store your data, schema lists is like, here are the tools to store your data. You make sure that you can get to it and it's all stored well. <coughs> all right? you, as a developer, it's your responsibility. That's schema list. Okay? And you could change at any time. Schema, though, much more restricted. And schema is slower because you got all this you know, weight, right? You got all this weight about it's got to be a certain way, and particularly the queries could get heavy, some of the inner join stuff. So that's a schema database. Schema list much faster, and it scales much better, horizontal, horizontal distribution, scales much better. So, you know, this, this deal right here just sort of shows how a relational database, a schema with a schema, right, how, how we connect tables, we build tables, and we connect data. So a database, and when we talk about relational databases, a database is made up of, a, I don't know, I'll make this, uh, rename this to, this is like week 12, we're covering this. And then uh, I'm going to create a new document. Might as well. I'll call this one week 12 data, data hierarchy. So, uh, uh, when we uh, talk about relational databases, relational databases, it could also be relational database management system, something like that. And these are the parts of relational database management system. So we have uh, the database. A database is made up of tables. Tables are made up of records. Records are made up of fields, and fields are made up of characters. All right, so that's a data hierarchy. That's what I need to put here. That's the data hierarchy. Okay, so a whole database made up of tables. Tables are made up of records. What's a record? Well, here's a record. Here's a record. Here's a record. Here's a record. Right? Just like the school has, you know, your academic record. That's an entry in a table somewhere. <laughs> it's a record. <laughs> So, and here's a table. So, database is made up of tables. So, this database is made up of three tables, customers, rentals, movies. Each table is made up of records, right? Each record is made up of fields. So, here's the ID field. Here's the first name field, right? And each, each field stores characters, J-O-N for John. 
So we went from the smallest little element that's stored to the whole big picture, the whole database. That's the data hierarchy. It's just like that's how we think about databases. The main thing you want to know is this relational database deal. Here we have, right, uh, American Beauty has movie ID 2. So here, this rental transaction 1, the movie rented was ID 2, which is American Beauty, is rented by customer ID 5, and customer ID 5 is many. So many rented American Beauty. That was rental transaction 1. And that's called the key field, and it has to be unique. Every record needs a unique identifier so that we could reference it, right? So that's relational databases. And you're learning about databases, so I just want to make sure. I know we already went over that, but I don't know if I got it on video. I thought we might have done it afterwards. How many people that just like taught you something new? Cool. So this right here, knowing this, is huge. All right, that's huge. Anybody have questions about all that? Got it? So those are databases. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So let's talk about uh, systems development and programming. And uh, one of the, you know, and we're just going to jam through this. So one of the main points is that people are idiots and we're blind. We have a really hard time predicting the future. We have a hard time predicting the future. We have a hard time seeing around the corner, right? And some of the way that that happens is science fiction writers and, and our artists, right? Our artists fantasize about what could be. Look back in the day to uh, George Orwell, 1984, writing that book, and then holy cow, we totally have a big brother state where we're all being monitored all the time. Whoa, right? Now, that's not necessarily by design, but, you know, I mean, it's not like George Orwell thought of that, but maybe he kind of saw that coming some, right? And then, you know, if you look to Star Trek or Star Wars, like, pe like people who are in technology grew up on those shows, and they're like, man, I want to invent that. Let's invent that. Like, it was wild to think about walking around with a little device in your pocket that then you could just pull it out and go, dip, dip, dip. yes, uh, Scotty, can you beam us up? Now, we don't got beaming yet, and that's not correct English. I said that kind of just in a vernacular way. We don't have beaming yet, but we got those little devices in our pocket where we could just talk to anybody, anywhere in the world at any time. Whoa, right? And not only that, like, you know, I don't know, what else did we get from Star Trek, but... So, you know, sometimes the, the literature, science fiction, artists, you come up with ideas and then people are like, wow, can we actually build that and implement it? So Stun some guns. of that creativity, right, comes from that. Stun guns. Stun guns, maybe, right? Set it to stun. Black hole device? What is it? A black hole device? A black hole device? I don't know. I didn't watch Star Trek. <laughs> that. Star Trek, so. I didn't watch that enough. Communicator. <laughs> Communicator. <laughs> right? Dick Tracy, right? Those little watches. Like now you got watches you could talk to and your watch knows everything. And so that we get inspired by art. Art inspires us as innovators. But there's all kinds of examples of people just like, you know, not getting it. Right? Like people who should have known better, like what's coming, not seeing what's coming. So seeing around that corner is really big. Like what's the next big invention? Right? It's out there. Right? What is it? You know, what's the next big kind of app or website or whatever you know what is it driver drive you know driverless cars is huge truck dri drivers are gone in 10 years that occupation is done 10 years no more truck drivers no more bus drivers you know cars will be driving themselves hydrogen cars you know fuel sales there's just like a big thing like the exhaust from that is oxygen and water whoa right so, uh, you know, what's coming? Anti-air lasers. Huh? Anti-air lasers. No, yeah. they're doing that. Uh, they have the, um, I remember Boeing had to uh, discontinue their contract with the U.S. military, but they had the... Uh, yeah, they got lasers that shoot stuff down now. Yeah, like yeah. anti-missile. Yeah. I believe yeah. they're yeah. developing, they're starting it up again. Development yeah, on, uh, yeah, you can watch videos of that, like YouTube, uh, uh, mi uh, laser missile, laser beam, you know, um, GTA, Grand Theft Auto, laser, laser, <laughs> military, right, 
And uh, yeah, so here's you know one of them, and new U.S. military laser gun on USS Ponce, and shows him shooting down things, and it's like that's pretty awesome. They had tests where it shot down some UAVs. Yeah, that's cool. Real Star Trek phaser science friction. Oh, that's so <laughs> They, yeah. they also have the uh, railgun stuff. The railguns. Oh, yeah, railguns are better. And then they yeah. have the, um, you know that weird uh, sort of um, dish that they put on top of some Humvees? I don't know what that oh, is. It's like gets rid of all the cockroaches, puts out a high frequency. No, no, it actually, <coughs> it actually shoots out like a microwave, and it's just supposed to be used as like a crowd control. And just makes them a little bit hot. Starts yeah. cooking the people. So right there. Yeah, right there. Vehicle yeah, mounted and out. active. Like, whoa, I'm getting hot. <laughs> yeah, it feels like you're, apparently it feels like you're burning alive. But it doesn't actually do any damage to people. Wow. Interesting, right? Okay. Well, you know, the Japanese were testing this in World War II. And they tested on, quote, unquote, monkeys. and But they called the prisoners of war monkeys. Oh. And they put them out in the field and turned the microwave on. And. They cooked them all. Uh, so, uh, yeah, all kinds of interesting stuff. But what's the world going to look like? How do you see around the corner? So that's a big part of systems development is just innovation. And so innovation is like looking at something that doesn't work and how do I, how do, I do, it, do, it diff do it different, do it better. So, you know, uh, one of the places you, it's like screaming for innovation is anytime you're frustrated. And you be registering for classes at City College. I'm frustrated, right? Great, that system can be innovated. And so a system is how you do something, right? Like there's a system for registering for classes at City College, right? Well, how can we make that system different? There's a system that McDonald's, like business is all about systems, perfecting the system, right? Getting a system in place to sort of process, you know, uh, whatever service you're, or product you're delivering to your customer, right? McDonald's, they've got systems, right? And, uh, and you know... I don't know if you've ever worked there or what, but they have a whole system for the whole deal. That's a big part of it. Like any good business is going to have systems. And so development is like, systems development is, let's look at the current system and how do we maybe come up with a better system. Right? That's systems development. And that requires innovating, often requires programming. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, the innovation part, there's just a whole bunch of people who, like, you know, didn't see what was coming. The CEO of IBM saying, you know, there's a worldwide market demand for maybe five computers. Granted, that's in 1943 when the ENIAC and the UNIVAC were like, you know, huge accomplishments and took up, you know, a building in and of themselves and were super expensive. And, right? But who would have guessed, right? We're carrying them around in our pockets. Who wants to hear actors talk? That's the founder of Warner Brothers. Uh, we don't like their song, sounding and guitar music's on the way out, rejecting the Beatles, 1962. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Office, uh, Commissioner, U.S. Office of Patents, 1899. <laughs> so. Um, so, yeah, computers and business, information systems. We're talking about system. And there's like a good video, how UPS works, if you want to kind of see how systems work. Uh, so there it is. And uh, users of information systems, right, will think about who are the users and try to tailor an information system, right? So there's computer, there's information systems. You can study that field. Or there's computer science. Like, you know, if you go University of Michigan information systems, right? There's uh, MS information systems, right? The Master of Science information systems, right? We could even go School of Information Systems. There we go. And then we can look at computer science. So information systems, to me, is like the watered-down computer science. And I'm sure that there's plenty of people who would take offense <laughs> at what I just said. But uh, just checking. You know, comp sci is like, you know, what is computer science? Let's check that out. And computer science is awesome. You know, it's uh, shaping virtually everything. Uh, invent the future. Anyhow, you can check that out. And then, uh, and then, University of Michigan Information Systems. 
I'm just looking for what is information systems to see if they say anything. Maybe media will tell us something. Whatever. Anyhow, two fields, right? Very closely related, but information systems is more like a business. How does business use technology? Or how do organizations use technology? How do we implement it? Right? What kind of new system should we have here? You know, a system that uses technology. Computer science is about programming it and building it, and right? And the information systems is more about using it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you think about who are the users, and so here's a I think they call this a hierarchy, organizational hierarchy, right? Where, and this is the traditional pyramid structure where you got a leader up the top, and then various levels of, of you know, upper management and management and then employees. You guys seen this? You know this? Anybody not know this? This makes sense. Okay, so like the CEO is running the company. And the vice presidents of mar there's will be like a vice president of marketing, a vice president of finance, a vice president of you know production, right? And each of those people are in charge of those areas, vice president of accounting, and they'll all meet with the CEO and report on this is what's going on in accounting, this is what's going out on at the production floor, this is what's going on with our finances, right? And and so they all know their individual areas within the organization. And then they, you know, like the vice president of production, you know, might have, you know, 10, 10 manage, managers beneath them. And each of those managers, like one is doing like this shop over here. The other two are doing that assembly area over there, the night shift, the day shift. And those managers are always reporting, hey, this is how things are going to the vice president. And then the vice president reports that up to the president. Right, and then those tw twelve managers right here, just to look at the people on the assembly line or whatever the production floor, they're watching the employees who are working there, you know, and, and so you know that's kind of how it all works. You got the snake's head <laughs> up here at the top, right? This is the person running it all, right? And they're kind of like monitoring everything, and 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 they're more like the very long term strategy where we're going. How are we going to get there? These people are like, you know, what's happening today? I'm punching the clock. I'm building this thing today. But the CEO is thinking about five years from now, we really need to get out of that and get into this and change our product line and shift everything over and make sure all of our assets are aligned and, you know, to do that. And, all right. So that'd be more like the CEO's job. But, you know, depending upon what level you are in that, you know, organization, you're going to have different information needs. You're going to have different information needs. And so they have different systems out there, and these are like the buzzwords in business that you would learn about, you know. But those different systems apply to different levels. Like TPS is transaction processing system, right? So TPS reports are kind of made famous, or they are mentioned in uh, in this movie called Office Space, right? So you could go watch the Office Space trailer, and they talk about TPS reports. It's a pretty dang funny movie. It's pretty great if you haven't seen it. We'll watch the trailer for it right now, I guess. <laughs> have you, have I so uh, TPS reports, those would be like transaction processing systems. That's like the checkout system. Uh, that's one example of a TPS. Like the checkout system was hugely revolutionary where you just scan items, right? Whoa, right? It has a barcode, you know, like back in the day when I was in high school, there was a, na a guy who lived across the street. His full-time job was checkout clerk, right? And that's how he supported his family. He worked at Safeway, and he had, like, a union and benefits. And he would just, you know, oh, $1.79, two twenty, and read the sticker they put on the can, right? Like, if they want to change the price of, like, beans, they had to go get the little thing and put a new sticker on, put a new sticker on, put a new sticker on. All right, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Like that, you know, and now that's really expensive. So they innovated that system. How do we check people out? Instead of paying these people a lot of money to be really good at, you know, running a 10 key and entering the right price, you know, we could hire the dumbest <laughs> low-wage workers, minimum wage, and all they got to do is listen for the beep. You know, they run the thing over the scanner, and if they hear a beep, good, Right? And the right, and we want to change the prices. We just enter it in the computer, 
And that's the price now when people bring up that can of beans. And we just changed the one little placard, beans, right in front to show the price, right? Like, whoa. And not only that, but now the computer, when we receive things, we say, oh, we got 100 of these. We put that into our computer as inventory. And every time we sell one, we decrement that. We take one away from 100. We get down to 20. We know it take, we're selling four a day. And it takes five days to get here from, from the vendor, right? So we, it automatically reorders, right? And then right when you're running out, the new stuff comes in. And that was like Walmart. Sam Walton put that system into place, killed it, because he could reduce the, the back side of the store, how much inventory there was, reduce his real estate costs, lower the prices to the customer, right? And his inventory is arriving right when he runs out. He doesn't have to have that extra 30% of his store back there. Construction costs, real estate costs. He could devote that to retail space, right? And uh, and just when he's running out, the new of something in inventory, the new stuff arrives. Whoa! So that's like you know an example of a transaction processing system. And then it'll produce reports that the manager can look at. How much of the stuff are we selling? Did anything kind of make an exception? An exception report. Usually we sell four of these a day. Yesterday we sold forty. What the hell's going on? Well, rain. That's why we're selling so many umbrellas. Ah. All right, so let's have our, our system watching. When the weather's predicting rain, we know that that goes up <coughs> 10, 10 times. And so if rain's coming in in five days, let's get our rain umbrella supplier to make sure we got umbrellas. We don't want to run out. We want to make that money. That's a system. That's business. You get in business, and it's like there's no more bull crap, man. It's like we got to get lean, trim, make money, get things working well. And if you know how that, to do that, you're going to be valuable. So that's like a TBS, and then MIS would be like a system that you know management and upper management would use, and that's management information system. So it'll just give them information about how things are running. And this is all somewhat theory, but it's also application. And then DSS, decision support software, that'd be like the thing that's getting external data, like oh the rain, and when rain happens, this happens. And there's an entire field of data science. Where you're looking at data and like for correlations, and so hey, look, you know, we got to bring this in every time it's raining. We got to make sure we have more umbrellas because we get you know an increase in sales for umbrellas. So let's let's have our stores, let's have our system monitoring all the weather where all of our stores are, and when there's rain coming, make sure they get that stuff when they get it. Costco does this right. It's like you know that's how you tell the seasons anymore. Right? You don't look around at the trees. It's just like, what's Costco selling? <laughs> you know? Oh, summer must be coming. Look at what Costco's selling. Right? And then that stuff's gone. You know, they sell you what, what you need when you need it. They're looking at the trends. And then executive information system, best way to summarize that is build me a clock. Don't tell me the time. No, tell me the time. Don't build me a clock. They don't want to know. Executives have to have just a little synopsis, a little summary. They got to go drink at the country club and all that important stuff, right? So they don't want you to build them a clock. They just want to know the time. I actually had one of my bosses say that to me one time. And it was like this company of 20 people, but he was the CEO. He said, Todd, don't build me a clock. Just tell me the time. He didn't want to know all the details. He just wants to know what's, what's the result. So those are the different systems, some of them. And then, you know, decision support software. There's graphical information software where you can map data, right, graphically. That's old hat. And CAD and CAM, you know, is software that's for design, computer-aided design for drawing diagrams. And computer-aided manufacturing would help manufacture. And then there's artificial intelligence. So this is just like a couple of topics thrown in together, this presentation. So systems development, that was kind of systems development. And, uh, and the innovation and some of the different systems. And then we have more down here, so we're going to jump down to that, and then we'll come back up. So SDLC is Systems Development Lifecycle. And so the textbook will talk about like this Systems Development Lifecycle. And basically, it's this decision-making process that we all use anyhow, right? And so when you want to innovate and create a new system, you come in, you do a little investigation, you do some analysis, you design it, you acquire what you need to, to put the system in, you implement it, and you maintain it, right? So investigate, analyze, design, acquire, implement. That's kind of what we do. You notice like something's not working that well. I'm hungry. Well, what's that pain in my belly? Did I get punched? No. Oh, I must be hungry. You investigate it. Do a little more analysis. Right? I haven't eaten since yesterday. No wonder. 
right? And then you design a solution. I'm getting me over to Burger King. I don't know why I'm talking like I, I've had no education right now. I'm going to Burger King, right? Yeah, or where do people go? Burger King's not so great. I'm going to Whole Foods, right? And then you acquire what you need. I want that pizza. I want that sandwich. And then you implement it. You eat it. And then you kind of like reflect. Was it good? Am I full? Do I need more? No, I need more. You go back, right, and get some more. <laughs> so that's just like that's the systems development life cycle. And then when you implement the system, you could do it in a direct, parallel, phased, or pilot way. So there's a picture that captures that pretty well. So there's the old system. You know, Friday was old system. You come in Monday, there's a new system. That's one way you can implement. Problem with that is if the new system fails, eh, you don't got any backup. And, uh, you know, the people using the new system, right, like it might be hard for them. There's no transition. Uh, you could do the a parallel conversion where the old system and the new system run in parallel for a while. So if the new system breaks, you know, then you got the old system. You could do a phased conversion where you slowly phase in the new system and phase out the old. And you could do a pilot system where you try it at one location first, and if it works, then you start rolling it out to other locations. It's usually pilot, phase, some parallel, you know. Me, a lot of times in our own lives, though, just individually, we just like, screw that old system, and we try something new. You know, we just switch. So that's, uh, that's uh, implementation. So let's go back up. So here's one more topic so we looked at one topic we looked at right when it was starting was databases the next topic we looked at was systems right systems design systems analysis now we're going to look at artificial intelligence so AI artificial intelligence is, is a computer intelligent right how do we make computers intelligence how would you measure how would you measure whether or not a computer is intelligent how would you measure that how do you measure whether or not something's intelligent? How old the computer is? <laughs> cool. So artificial intelligence, that's great. Artificial intelligence is the field of making computers like humans. It's kind of what it is. Can they think, talk, respond like humans? Can they move like humans? So how would you measure whether or not a computer is like a human? Computers can be like you give him what to do. He can do something by himself. Are you doing things by yourself? Yeah. Are you? No, you're, the only reason that you're talking right now is because he started talking. So you, you're, you're responding to the action. I can, do, I can think like if I want to catch my phone, but he can't just okay, sure. Google by himself. Like he can't just do anything. Yeah, so it gets really philosophical pretty quick when you start talking about can computers be humans, right? Can they be like humans? Can they think like humans? Can they talk like humans? Can they walk like humans? Well, they, you know, and that's what like the sci-fi movies like, oh, you know, there's one out not too long ago. I saw the trailer for it. It looked pretty good. Ex Machina? Maybe. I don't know. It was the lady robot, right? Yeah, and the guy is like in a house or something, and yeah. it turns out he's a robot too. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't know it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Here, let's watch that. I believe that's. Ex Machina is a ghost in the machine. I think that's what that means. Is this it? It's, it means um, from the machine. From the machine? Yeah. Alright, we're going to watch this. And... Did you see that? I didn't know. Oh. Did anybody see that? Was it good? It was good? He's a robot, huh? That's why he's like, oh crap, and he starts cutting himself. He is also a robot created by that same guy, but he wasn't even aware of it. Huh? Yeah, and so you heard them mention the Turing test in there. And so it's kind of cool just to connect the things we're learning about here into pop culture. So when you get out <coughs> in the world, now when you hear somebody talk about the Turing test, you're like, I know what that is. And so this is one way that uh, Alan Turing, and Alan Turing, you know, is this uh, really brilliant mind, helped crack the Nazi code. And there's also a movie about him um, that was out not too long ago called The Imitation Game. Yeah, there it is, 2014. And sad story, because he was a homosexual, 
And at the time, I was really, you know, like a lot of people were uncomfortable with that. And so uh, somebody ended up, he, they, they put him on house imprisonment because of being a homosexual. And then uh, somebody either poisoned him and killed him or he poisoned and killed himself because of it. So kind of sad story. Definitely a sad story. And a loss to humanity because he was brilliant, super brilliant guy. And uh, anyhow, his test for whether or not something is uh, uh, a computer is uh, artificially intelligent, can machines think, is the Loebner Prize. And, uh, and it's also the Turing test. And it's if you don't, if you are talking, somehow communicating with, uh, communicating with another person, and you can't tell or machine, a person or a machine, you can't tell if that's a person or a machine, right? And it turns out to be a machine. You thought it was a person, then that machine has been deemed to be artificially intelligent. So if it tricks you, right? Like you think you're talking with a human, and uh, and no, it turns out to be a machine then that machine is artificially intelligent. And the crazy thing about this is like, just in the last five years, like if you go back five years and look at like voice stuff that's happening on the phone and auto dialers and self-help systems, like they used to be really wonky and really bad, and now they're getting good, right? It's like, you know, they could start, they could hear what you're saying, they could process natural language, and, and they could respond a lot more effectively. It's, it's amazing, right? Oh really? Yeah. Siri. Oh Siri. Apple. Yeah. Siri. Yeah. It's recorded by some woman. It generates the wife by some. It was just recorded. Wow. Yeah. So it's uh that's that's hard how you would test or you know that's how one way to test. So you can check out like that movie also about Alan Turing here. We'll watch that trailer. I guess right now it's trailer day. I'm enjoying it. I don't know about you guys. You want to watch this one or no? Sure. Yeah. All right. Me too. Why not? No, let's go. So uh, that was great. I, I think that's a you know it's kind of fun to watch movies and pop culture and and get insights into what we're actually learning in this material. You know, so artificial intelligence. Uh, Alan Turing, the Turing test, Ex Machina, you know, the imitation game, uh, awesome stuff. Check those movies out, you know, like this weekend. They're good watching, it looks like, and uh, I can't talk today. I have, like, total, like, like, I don't know. You're talking more. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like I'm talking like I'm, I never, like, I'm, I don't have good English. Um, so, that's, uh, watch those movies and it'll reinforce what we're learning. So, um, you know, another part of AI is robots. Like, can they move like humans? And robots is pretty interesting. Uh, robots are interesting. You know, so you could YouTube, like, Big Dog Robot or, you know, Battlefield Robotic Systems or Human Exoskeleton that helps you carry more weight or be more superhuman, jump further, farther, faster, run further, farther, faster. It's like wearing, uh, you know, exoskeleton. You know, um, in in home Roombas, you know that do your your vacuuming. The Predator UAV system, not so much a robot, but you know a remote controlled plane that you know shoots missiles and things. But very interesting, you know, to have machines in battle, you know, that aren't manned by people in battle. So the people who are killing others are doing it from Arizona. So you wake up in the morning, kiss your wife goodbye, say goodbye to your kids, you know, drive in. Uh, curse about the traffic, stop at Starbucks, get to work, sit down at your computer, take, make your plane that's in the Middle East take off, you know, watch video of where you're flying, see some little dots running <laughs> on the ground, blow them up, and then have somebody come by and slap you upside the head, tell you a joke, and ask if you want to go over to, you know, uh, California Pizza Kitchen for lunch. <laughs> and you just killed eight people, which are just pixels on your screen, you know. Like, people who do the unmanned aerial vehicles have really high PTSD because PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, it, uh, it's associated not with being in harm's way, but with harming people. Like, that's the highest correlation. I'm sure there's, there's a big piece of it that's being in harm's way, but the biggest piece is uh, harming people is where PTSD comes from, which is interesting. So the people who do these things and they fly the Predator drones, they have some of the highest PTSD. And they're not even in battle. 
because they are harming others, right? And they're just watching on the screen. It like haunts them and messes with their psyche. So, and you can watch, you know, you can go on YouTube and, and watch YouTube videos that somebody is like taken out, you know, and I don't know, snuck out or something. I can't imagine the military would release those. YouTube videos of, pred of footage shot from the Predator drones when they're on runs, blowing stuff up and killing people. Ha 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 ha! I say that with a laugh. I don't know why. So pretty fascinating stuff, and uh, and so this is like uh, some of the stuff that's in our list here, and this is accessible on Blackboard under lectures, and you could go you could go through this, and right we talked about databases, so we just did that, and uh, the data hierarchy and that puzzle we looked at, and key fields, right? And we didn't do any of this stuff, um, and then well I'm not scrolling. And then uh, we looked at uh, websites last week. But then uh, e-commerce, we haven't talked about that yet. But e-commerce is just electronic commerce. We did talk about the dot-com boom. That rings a bell. But then there was some stuff in here about making money online. And so I just want to leave those up for a second because we kind of talked about that last week or recently. And, uh, and, you know, you could use these places to start to make good money. And I think I, sh I shared with you guys last week, right, like I'm selling some trainings on Udemy. And that's like, whoa, this is all right, man. Like, I'm making good beer money <laughs> and some, you know. So, you know, get on it and start innovating and, and making your own future. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in here about uh, uh, cyber war. And so these are really great links. I'm just going to kind of walk through them, and then that'll be it. But uh, cyber war, robots, drones, and artificial intelligence. So there's an interesting 60 Minutes on Stuxnet, Stuxnet. So that's like, you know, um, that's like the first virus, computer warm virus, that actually physically did damage to some location. And there's a computer warm, worm that physically damaged physical assets. And uh, so uh, it, it's not, you know, nobody knows. Nobody said, hey, we did that. But most people say is the United States and Israel created a virus and snuck it into Iran. And they got it inside Iran's uranium nuclear processing facilities. And they, they, you know, the computer virus made the centrifuges, which process uranium and turn it into, you know, nuclear grade, right? Uh, were spinning too fast, but they were reporting to the computer that everything was fine. So the centrifuges were burning out, right? And, uh, and then some German security firm that the Iranians hired came in, found the virus, and then released it and said, who wrote this? Does anybody know or... You know, this is what we found. We should, the world should be aware of this. And so then that's out there in the world for people to then see as a model, right? Oh, this is how you create a weapons-grade virus. <laughs> and that's kind of a cool phrase, weapons-grade virus. I like that. And, uh, and so, you know, then another one, DoQ, or however you say that, was another virus that came out. And, uh, and then, you know, New York Times had this great article about Hackers being able to sell computer flaws that would allow, you know, vulnerabilities, uh, and they sell them to nations. And so there's a website where if you're a hacker and you find a flaw, you could sell it to the highest bidder. And the nations will be like, yeah, totally, I want to be able to know what that is, and I'll be the one using it, and I'll pay you $4 million for it, right? So I could then get into co computers of the people, other people, other countries, or whatever, right? So that's kind of a really fascinating article. And, uh, and then there's like uh, military robots in the future of war. This is a really good TED talk right here. It's pretty fascinating. Military war robots in the future of war. We'll take a brief look at that here in a second. And then uh, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. We already talked about them. But their goal was to have uh, half, of all, um, all, half of all vehicles in combat to be unmanned by 2015. Oh, I just totally... 2015, one third, sorry, one third should be unmanned by 2015, all vehicles in combat. I, I don't know if they reach that or what. And then we have, uh, you know, Boston Dynamics. They got acquired by Google. So Google kind of went on a robot buying spree a year or two ago. Interesting. And, uh, and then Robots That Fly and Cooperate, another great TED Talk. And Quadrocopter Pull Acrobatics. So you can watch this video where quadrocopters are like, whoa. And you could start to envision that what it's going to look like is that, you know, you could have a swarm of flying robot bees, the size of bees. You could release a 
billion of them in your enemy's country, and each of them could have a little vial of cyanide, right? And those bees are just going to swarm the country, and, and they could be programmed for certain targets. And they'll fly right into the Pentagon, fly right into the White House. You know, there's the president, and you know, just inject them with cyanide, whatever. They're a bunch of little robot flying things. Like, that's very possibly the future of war, and not too distant future. <laughs> And so if you look at these quadrocopter deals, right, it's like, wow, that's pretty amazing. But, you know, like, holy cow, right, just to envision that. And it really then becomes a, 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 a humanity, our population is one where it's um, the people who have access to that technology, right, that, those weapons, those tools, and then the vast majority who do not, right. Um, this is great, just the Tesla S, Model S, shows a bunch of robots making cars. And, uh, and this is great, how robots think. It shows how Amazon does fulfillment. And so they have huge warehouses, Amazon, and, uh, and you place an order. Um, they don't have somebody walk a half a mile and go get that one thing you wanted. They have these little robots that go over and get it and then bring it back, and then they hand it to the person packing the box. So when all the robots have gotten all the things for an order, they come up to the, the person and they say, here you go. And then they take all those little things from the robots and put them in the box. The human does that part. Confirms these are the right things. That's the order. Okay, this box is ready to go. And they just stand at the place and wait for robots to bring them the things from orders. And the robots are going out and picking off the shelves. They actually bring the whole stack. Right? It's pretty fascinating to watch that. And then there's the Google driverless car and Tesla autopilot. We've already looked at that. And... Uh, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff on drones at war, and drones here at home, right? Um, interesting stuff. And then AI, there's, uh, there's some interesting things in here. So a uh, computer completely whooped humans on Jeopardy. That was like four or five, seven years ago, a long time ago. Hey, there's the trailer for Ex Machina. That's cool. Here's a PBS thing, which is nice, uh, The Rise of Artificial Intelligence. We'll watch the beginning of that. And uh, artificial intelligence, machine versus man, Loebner really Prize. Hmm? You can watch. What you I do? Have a really good video about All right, it. let's check it out. Hold on. And uh, and then gambling, artificial intelligence, and gambling. So they created, you know, um, like people like. I don't know, this is also a really fascinating article, New York Times. But it's a, a company is, that creates the algorithm for gambling, and they have to make it not too hard. Because then, you know, people never play. They always lose, right? But, you know, it's just fascinating how they did it. I can't even explain it. But, uh, you know, this is like the future of slot machines right here. <laughs> and, and so the computers learn how you play with them, you know? Whoa. So are you a bluffer? Are you a folder? And they keep you hooked. So you keep putting in more money. Uh... The Turing test, human brain, the quantum computing, oh, huge, dude. Quantum computing is amazing. So Google's got a quantum computer computing lab, and that's just like a whole deal in and of itself. You should totally watch these three videos. And, uh, kill yeah, kill decision shouldn't belong to a robot. So there's already, you know, machines out there that are used in war that can decide whether or not to kill a human. And there's examples of those machines making those decisions. So, for instance, the, you know, divide between North and South Korea, uh, they have a bunch of uh, automatic snipers where they just shoot humans if they're moving in the wrong area. If you're in that no man's land, you get shot, right? Uh, and then sometimes those machines malfunction and kill all the people working on it. <laughs> There's a couple of cases of that, you know. And this talk's not so great. It's a little bit boring, but kind of interesting. And, uh, and then, you know, no roads, there's a drone for that. So uh, PBS, the rise of artificial intelligence. We'll go back and look at that. And then also uh, the other one I said we might look at was what? Military robots <coughs> in the future war. Uh, all right, so uh, that's uh, basically the deal for today. How many people, that was like just way too long for you today? No? It's good? How many people liked everything you learned today? How many people got bored out of their mind? So some good stuff, right? Some really good stuff. All right, so you have something you wanted to share, Carson? Oh, I don't know. Maybe not. I can 
could show you. You know what? I'll show it. I'll send it to you. Okay. And then I could can look at it off offline and see if it's any good. But I I want you to watch it. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's check out uh, these two things. First, we'll look at PBS, and then we'll look at uh, um, the other deal. And I'll bring this up, so if you're watching at home, you could see which one I'm... Well, you got the link, but... Whoa, I can't have other people sound. So the rise of artificial intelligence right there, and then, uh, and then also we're going to look at this one, the future of war. And so that's right here. That's that one. 